Grazie. Uh, che piacere. What a pleasure to be here with, uh, with you here, of course, in my home and you in your homes. But uh, these are the days uh, there is always a solution to do something culturally and to appreciate beauty. Uh, and of course, beauty is the word that comes to mind when we say the name Raffaello. Let me share my screen with you. And start the slideshow. As you can imagine, um, countries around the world had prepared um, events, lectures, conferences, plenty of exhibitions uh, in celebration of Raffaello's 500th anniversary. And then you know what happened, the pandemic came and all of these beautiful events had to be canceled. So it is a particular privilege, privilege for me to be invited by uh, the Friends of Italy Society in Hawaii tonight to be a little bit part of this year of celebrations. And who knows, we may be, we may be one of the last places to be part of a, a long, long series of events that somehow had to be um, reformatted, to put it mildly. So thank you so much, um, Chiara. I really appreciate this. Um, and um, as you know, um, Italians are the, the most popular nation on earth. You can go anywhere on the planet. You mentioned Italy and everybody is in awe. I went to China two years ago and of course there was a Renaissance um, exhibition at the National Museum in Beijing and, and you could hardly see the, the paintings because people were just in awe. So that's what it is with, with Italy and Italian culture. And then, well, and then come names like Raffaello, Raffaello. And surely you'll agree, when you hear the name Raffaello, you'll be very quick to add another two names, right? You know what names? Michelangelo and um, Leonardo, of course. And you see, it's kind of interesting. We mentioned these three spectacular artists by their first names. You know, I, while I was preparing, I thought, it's interesting. We say Picasso, we don't say Pablo. We say Monet, we don't say Claude. <laughs> we say Gauguin, right? Um, well, Van Gogh, maybe we do say Vincent because of the many endearing movies that have come out lately. But usually we don't mention these great artists by their first name. So there is something magical about these three to the point that many scholars refer to them as the Holy Trinity, right? Now, among the three, I read, I was surprised to read that, but there were plenty of publications, especially now for the, for the anniversary, that said that in comparison to Michelangelo and Leonardo, Raffaello is a little bit neglected. I'm sure by the end of this year, no one will say that, but it was interesting to me to, for me to hear that that is an impression that some scholars, historians of art in the field had, um, because it's easy really to think of a major movement in the 19th century, right, the pre-Raphaelites, they loved Raffaello. I mean, no one else existed that Raffaello. That Raphael. Maybe they overdid it and people felt like it was a little bit too much and we want to hear and see more of Michelangelo and Leonardo. Or maybe something else could account for an alleged less attention being paid to Raffaello. And maybe it's this. Michelangelo, always very controversial. We know of his fights, his disputes, his moods, his difficult character. Um, by comparison, Raffaello was all dolcezza, sweetness, right? Think of Leonardo. Leonardo, with Leonardo always comes a mystery, right? You can't talk of any of his paintings without someone uh, coming up with a mystery, something that has to be solved. It seems that when we think of Raffaello, we don't associate mysteries. But you know, there is one painting that I like to show you tonight, and maybe you'll agree that there is a mystery included there. Um, I thought I would just show you these three drawings. Uh, the first one showing Raphael is um, uh, you know, believed to be a self-portrait, but he was maybe 17 or 18, very, very young. He was obviously younger than Michelangelo and, um, and Leonardo. Leonardo, I think, was 40 years older than him. So imagine the difference, right? But we know that these two, Leonardo and Raffaello, had a good relationship, a cordial relationship. Raffaello looked up to Leonardo. He also looked up to Michelangelo. But um, Michelangelo was not particularly impressed about that. Let's put it this way. Well, 
um, I should give you a little bit of background, right? Where was this person born? What was his family like? And so how did he make it from princely Urbino, an enchanting Renaissance um, town to this day? If you haven't visited, you'll have to go. See, usually people just go to Rome and Florence. And while they have to visit those two major cities in Italy, trust me, Italy has dozens and dozens of smaller cities and towns, each one of them a gem. Urbino is certainly one of them. Um, I like if you to see where Urbino is on the map. Now, keep in mind San Marino, right? The little Republic of San Marino um, as a point of reference. Under it, you see a region that's um, um, called Pesaro e Urbino, and then you see the actual city of Urbino. And now if you move to the right map, the, the map on the right, You'll, you'll see, aha, all right, something is kind of right, rather intriguing. You, you, you'll recognize that still in the 19th century, whatever is in green on this map here, were the papal states. This was all territory of the Pope. And then look at San Marino, and then you'll recognize, oh, Urbino. Urbino was part of the Pope's um, state um, at the time when Raffaello was born and much later than that. And this is what Urbino looks like on a beautiful evening just after sunset. Uh, I was there uh, at that, around you know, the that time of the day or the early evening, and it is magical and it is absolutely spectacular. His family. Well, you know, Raffaello really uh, grew up with art. Um, not only did he grow up uh, with art, he grew up with an artist and that was his father. His father was Giovanni Santi, a very good artist himself. He was court, court painter in Urbino to um, Federico da Montefeltro. Um, uh, so really had an important job and always good commissions in Urbino. Uh, I'm showing you just one painting by his father. So you see the figure of Christ uh, flanked by two angels. And I like you to compare a little bit uh, Giovanni's painting with another uh, work of art by Raffaello. This is apparently the earliest documented uh, painting by Raffaello showing an angel. For some reason, young apprentices are always given an angel to paint. I know this, you know, that this happened to Leonardo and many more um, artists uh, during the Renaissance. And it's go back and forth, compare the colors, compare the mood, uh, compare the physiognomies. There is a family resemblance. And you'll probably recognize, I mean, you obviously know other paintings by Raffaello, but, um, you know, or you'll, you'll just get acquainted with some in a few moments. Uh, you can tell that his style has changed over time, but it seems to me that um, in his youth, uh, he was still, of course, very close to what he has learned from, from his father. Um, yes, and now, well, it was a long way. It was a very long way for Raffaello uh, going from Urbino to, to Rome. Um, he had very difficult years before he was finally able to get to Rome. You see, his father was very anxious to send him uh, to get his training early on, um, intriguingly, in somebody else's workshop. For us who have children, we may kind of like sympathize. It seems to be more difficult to train and teach our own children. So maybe that's what Giovanni Santi felt and he sent him to Perugino for training. We know that uh, Raffaello's mother was devastated. You know, she was a mama you know, who, uh, just the thought of letting her little boy who was only eight years old go, it must have been very hard on her and on, and on Raffaello for sure. Um, unfortunately, she died maybe a year later. Uh, then Raffaello lost his father at the age of 11. He still had a stepmother, his father had been married. There was an uncle who was a Catholic priest who also took care of him. But you can just imagine what, what it must have meant to be an orphan uh, without, without you know, sufficient protection to face life. And yet Raffaello did it. He did it without bitterness. He always was known for his dolcezza. And um, he went to Florence. He never stayed continuously long in Florence, but he always went to Florence. Of course, he knew if he gets the attention of the Medici or someone in that Medici family, there might be a commission for him. Um, it's in that period that he met Leonardo. So we know of... Um, the in of encounters that these two men had, a very young Raffaello and a very mature Leonardo. And then something magnificent happened. 
Bramante, you know Bramante. Bramante was um, the Pope's chief architect. Um, the Pope's name is Julius II, the same one who had commissioned the Sistine Chapel from Michelangelo. Bramante was, um, was a relation to Raphael. He was, you know, they were somehow related. And it is upon Bramante's uh, recommendation that Raffaello not only was able to go to Rome and meet the Pope, but got a really gorgeous commission uh, having to do with painting the papal apartments. I won't show you all the stanze. Stanze means uh, chamber or room. Uh, just this one, La Stanza della Segnatura. You may have seen that in my background, I had a painting and that is Raphael's painting from the Stanza della Segnatura. It has three major paintings. You can see here just in front of you, on your left, the Parnasso. And then there is a third one, La Disputa. But we are going to be talking about this one here. Um, surely you know the name of this famous painting. This is the School of Athens and Chiara mentioned it uh, in her um, introduction in the beginning. Um, it is absolutely breathtaking uh, to look at it, even on a screen, but of course, if you see it uh, live, it is uh, even more impressive. And what it is, it is a gathering of the greatest minds of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. In a way, Raphael is telling us, I know about philosophy. I know the greatest minds, the greatest scientists, and since I have a touch screen, I'll be able to zoom in here a little bit for you. You see, there is a center. There must always be a center in a Renaissance painting. And that center is um, dominated by two figures, one with um, a red rope here, another one with a blue. And you look a little bit more carefully, you can tell, well, one is older, the other one is younger. These are Plato and Aristotle. Aristotle was um, Plato's student at the Academy in Athens for 20 years. These two men never agreed on anything, and yet Aristotle stayed there for 20 years. It must have been a very dynamic relationship, the least to say. If I were able to zoom in any further, I could show you that Leonardo is holding a book entitled Timeo. This is a Timaeus. This is a book in which, or rather a dialogue, in which Plato unfolds his cosmology. And then same thing with the book that Aristotle holds, um, it says um, Etica, Ethics. He has two books of ethics, but Raphael felt like not, it would not be too important to get into the, the minutia here. The fact is that he correctly identified um, uh, Plato as being more interested in cosmology and metaphysics, and uh, which is why he shows upwards, right? His, his index shows upwards. While his uh, student Aristotle, well, Look at his hand, it is not showing downward. Oftentimes it is misdescribed uh, and misunderstood. He's showing the world in which we live. This is the empirical reality. So for R Raphael, this was a way to say, we need both, right? We need the metaphysical realm and we also need the ethics. That's a wonderful statement to make. They are surrounded by many more figures. This person here, this figure here could be, um, could be um, uh, Plotinus, um, it's not, a, you know, there are different interpretations, but everybody agrees that the figure left of, of the one who may be Plotinus is Socrates. Socrates was the teacher of uh, Leonardo, and he's obviously having a wonderful discussion there. Now, um, I'll focus on some other people here. Down here, right, you see a man who is bold, and I'll mention to you who that is, in, who that was in Rome, you know, whose features those were. Um, he, this is presumably Euclid, and he is teaching uh, students, right, about mathematics. And then I'll just move it a little bit here to the center. You see someone just kind of like leisurely sitting, or carelessly sitting on the stairs, um, looking like a beggar. This is Diogenes famous for having said in his uh, city, how many things there are that I don't need, right? Um, rather remarkable statement. And then I'll zoom in again here on this figure here now, right here. Um, this is Heraclitus, um, a pre-Socratic, lived before Socrates, uh, known for being somber, um, sometimes frankly cynical, definitely difficult. And then we'll move a little bit to the left. And then we'll see another 
teacher, obviously, somebody, you know, introducing um, youngsters, but also older people. We'll comment about this figure in a moment um, about mathematics, and that's Pythagoras. Yeah. So um, it is rather amazing to see how uh, well versed, how well uh, Raphael really knew um, ancient history. But there is more to this painting. Now, we just talked right about um, Leonardo and Aristotle. Uh, ah, I gave it away about Plato and Aristotle. Um, you look more carefully at the features of Plato. And yes, it is Leonardo, right? So Raphael chose the, the features of Leonardo to uh, depict, depict um, um, Plato. And um, remember the man, the bold man here, uh, who is Euclid? Uh, well, that was Bramante. So this is um, Raffaello kind of like paying homage to this friend and relative who helped him with his career in, um, in Rome. And Heraclitus, Heraclitus the difficult, the somber, well not surprisingly, <laughs> Raphael chose the features of Michelangelo for Heraclitus. I wonder what um, Michelangelo thought of this. And then um, in the big painting, the School of Athens, right, on the far right, um, Raphael managed to include himself, but with, without, you know, pretending to be a famous ancient person. This is kind of like Raphael just, uh, in a way, looking into the camera, right, and saying, hello, I'm here, okay? So he's not uh, embodying any of the, the famous people. Interestingly, he put himself near um, Ptolemy, the person with the back against you, he's holding a globe. Uh, and um, the, uh, another person holding a spear, and that is, um, I went too fast here, and, um, and that is um, uh, Zoroaster here. Now, um, having shown you here a, a tiny portrait of Raphael, I'd like you to know that there has been often a question about what Raphael really looked like, right? Well, you might say, well, we just saw it. I mean, wasn't that his self-portrait, right? Well, you see, um, we have a spatial reconstruction of, of Raphael. Um, the portrait on the left is very similar to what we saw in the School of Athens. Here, he was around 23, uh, has his really gentle features and uh, looks very, very innocent. He always managed to look innocent, I suppose. And then we look at the facial reconstruction, but just some background about um, uh, why we are, we are in a position, you know, why scientists were in a position to recreate the face of Raphael. Um, you see, in the 19th century, um, Raphael's tomb was open, most likely because of some work of restoration. They found a skeleton, actually they apparently found uh, more than one skeleton, and the assumption is that uh, his assistants and students later on were buried with him or near him. Um, um, his skeleton was, could be identified because of some clothing and some other details that I don't need to get into. And what they did in the 19th century is take um, uh, a plaster cast of the skull. And this um, uh, cast was used uh, to, for a facial reconstruction. So I'd like you to compare this, the, the, two, the two faces. Now, obviously, uh, on the left, we see Raphael at the age of 23. And on the right, that is a reconstruction of the skull when Raphael died at the age of 37. So ob obviously, clearly, this is an older person. Um, and some changes have to be expected. But um, take a look at the nose <laughs> on the left and the nose on the right. You can tell, right? Something has happened there. Raphael gave himself a nose job. <laughs> Obviously felt that his nose wasn't beautiful enough, right? So he corrected it in, in the self-portrait. Well, you know, a little bit of vanity, I think, um, is acceptable. And um, I do want to revisit the School of Athens. There are two unexpected figures. That's how I call them. Um, I did mention this, that someone was here near Pythagoras who looks a little bit different. Take a look um, how he's dressed, uh, his face, his turban. This is not an ancient person. 
what, what is someone who is not uh, a, a, an ancient Greek or an ancient Roman doing in a painting that says School of Athens? This, believe it or not, is uh, Ibn Rushd or the fam famous um, Averroes of the Latin tradition. Ibn Rushd was an Arab Muslim Andalusian philosopher and scientist. Yeah? Um, Ibn Rushd um, was included here and that is quite a tribute that Raphael the artist makes here to recognize um, figures who um, have made also many contributions to philosophy and sciences. He didn't include Thomas Aquinas, right? But he included Ibn Rush, very, very intriguing. And the second unexpected figure, um, yeah, look at, look at her, right? See the figure in white. She is not far away from Ibn Rush. Now I say she, so I like you to know that not everybody agrees that this is a woman. So let me give you some background. Um, we have some, some sources from the period telling us that Raphael had to submit the sketch uh, either to Pope Julius II or to a bishop who was put in charge of supervising Raphael's works. So we have two different versions here of the story. And apparently, um, whoever it was, the bishop or the pope, looked at the sketch and then pointed out the figure that is entirely in white and said, who is she? <laughs> And Raphael said, oh, it's Hypatia, Hypatia of Alexandria. She was um, one of the greatest minds of ancient times, uh, the best mathematician in the fourth, fifth century Alexandria, the daughter of a mathematician. She worked, she used to work at the library in Alexandria. We all heard about the library of Alexandria. Um, unfortunately, she remained a pagan at a time when Christianity had already spread within the Roman, in this case, the Byzantine Empire. And the story is that monks, Christian monks, attacked her and lacerated her to death. So she, she found a very early, untimely death. Um, Raphael really thought she should be included. Now, um, interestingly for me, is that the Pope or the Bishop did not object to the Muslim philosopher being included, but objected to the woman. So what did Raphael do? See, Raphael did not make a fuss. Michelangelo would have argued to stand his ground, kind of like, it's going to be like I say, or there won't be any painting. That was not Raphael's way. Raphael, of course, said, yeah, all right, no problem. I'll change the, the features. And what he did was very smart. So um, he chose the features of the Pope's favorite nephew, Francesco della Rovere, the future Duke of Urbino. So he's always also kind of like paying homage to his own, to his own city with that. And, um, and, and, you know, got away with that. And yet, I must say, whether it is now clearly a woman or less clearly a woman or clearly a young man, there is something about this one figure just looking at you. And the only other figure who does that is Raphael himself in that, in that painting. And if there were any doubts, I'd like you to know that I was finally able to find the, the cartone, the preparatory cartoon that um, Raffaello submitted to the bishop or the pope. And um, I couldn't wait, so I went straight to the figure here to see what do we have and how is it different? Because you see, so he was told that, you know, no woman up there in the school of Athens. And so he changed the features to look like Francesco de la Rovere. Uh, so I was always curious, I mean, you know, underneath, underneath the paint, I mean, is there something that um, shows that uh, it was really Hypatia that you may be sure? And I think it is clear. See, uh, in the original sketch, this figure was wearing a veil. Yeah, you see here, right? That, that's the veil on, on the forehead. So this was definitely a female figure and the story is obviously true. Yeah, all right. Well, you know, what is the point of speaking of a great artist, especially if he is Italian, without also speaking about Amore, right? About his, his love, love life. Um, well, Raffaello, believe it or not, was known to have had many affairs with uh, married women, unmarried women, uh, sometimes briefly, sometimes for longer periods. He even had a fiance. He never, you know, kind of like was in a hurry to marry. The fiance was very famous. Um, she, this was Maria Vigiena. She was the niece of a cardinal whose patronage 
uh, Raphael enjoyed, so he was definitely not going to say no, but he never said yes to the point of actually getting married. Instead, there was this great love. It, she was not the unique love, but she was the great love of his life, always referred as La Fornarina, yeah? the bakeress. Uh, we don't know whether she actually worked in a bakery, but we know that her father was a baker in Trastevere, which is a part of Rome. And her actual name was Margherita, Margherita Lucchi. So as it is clear that she was his model, that he always tried to find a way to include her in some of his paintings. And I'll show you two paintings now, of which it is said that they represent uh, La Fornarina. This one here is uh, at the uh, Palazzo Pitti in Florence, uh, La Donna Velata, uh, the woman with a veil. And um, you look at it, and of course, this is a beautiful woman, and um, she has this um, lavish um, veil over her head that goes close down. You look at her dress, and it's obviously silk. Um, Raffaello made sure that it would have that special shine that comes with silk, and then there is, there is a a corsaggio, uh, golden, you see where her hand is, she's like, kind of like trying to keep it all together. And there was jewelry and there was, you know, in her hair, around her neck, and it was just, just a, a fabulously beautiful woman. Now compare this to the next portrait of which it is also said that it is depicting La Fornarina. Look, <laughs> this is very different, <laughs> yeah? Uh, this painting here is at the Palazzo Barberini in Rome. Um, and he says, wow. So in one painting, she is definitely dressed, very dressed. And here, well, she barely has a transparent veil to cover her upper body, right? Oh, and then, wow. Then there is something about the band around her arm here, right? You see that blue, yeah? And then I have here, better picture to look at. Ah, all right, Raphael, right? He put his signature there and the rest is for Urbinensis, right? Raphael from the city of Urbino. Why put the name there? There's nothing unusual, right, with, with Renaissance artists signing, yeah? But why, you know, why put it on her arm? It's in a way like saying she is mine. But that is the impression one gets, right? This woman is my woman, yeah? And then there is something else intriguing. Um, here is, you know, the um, um, zo zoom into her um, left hand. There is a ring here. So from all that we know, this portrait was in Raphael's studio when he died. This is not something he wanted to uh, in any way, uh, um, you know, give up. So it stayed with him. And it was after his death, it was sold by one of his assistants. And most likely, that's when the ring was covered. So this, the, the, the existence of the ring became only clear when um, the painting was x-rayed in 2001. And apparently it's a ruby. I, I really fail to see that it is a ruby, but let's just assume that people know what they're talking about, people who know uh, gems. Um, so the question is, um, why was it painted over, right? So that's kind of like one of, a, a mystery that I wanted you to take home. You are already at home, so it will stay with you at home. But I wanted you to think about, um, why paint over the ring? And then, well, why was there a ring in the first place and what does it mean? And of course, um, the internet is full with possible explanations and suggestions, right? This is kind of like, a love story that's happening right now between a famous artist and, and a beautiful woman and everybody wants to know about the background. It's the same thing, right, with La Fornarina. Uh, some people say, well, maybe, maybe they were married. Maybe that was a wedding ring, right? And so obviously he could not marry the, the cardinal's niece, um, Di Biena, yeah? Uh, but then usually the wedding ring is, um, well, is it on the left hand, right? In Orthodox Christianity, it is. Um, but anyway, so I'll leave you with that. And I'll leave you with another question, which is that, which is that um, how, how can we really be sure that uh, both, that the two portraits, portraits show the, the same woman? So go a little bit back and forth, right? 
of course there is there is a resemblance and then you can start to look at the eyes and you start to look at the nose and the mouth and you go like yeah i think it's a good match back and forth um the one where she's barely dressed um definitely um depicts a younger fornarina i would say and maybe that is really the difference but life show her in such different ways right and maybe the one where she's barely dressed was never supposed to be shown in public and it was just going to be uh, to stay with him all his life, the way that Mona Lisa always stayed with, uh, with Leonardo, right? We will never know about the background of those. And we move on because although I had promised uh, Chiara that I would also talk about a lost portrait of, uh, of a young man and also get into the, um, the unveiled, the frescoes that were unveiled only this year. I can tell we're running out of time, so I better come to the end of my presentation. And um, well, I'm showing you the Pantheon because when um, um, Raffaello died, that was uh, a resting place that uh, the Pope chose for him. You see, he served Julius II, and then after that, he also served Leo X, who was a Medici, Medici Pope. Um, apparently, he had an even more cordial relationship with Leo X. And um, so we're not surprised that, that Leo felt that Raphael, Raphael really deserved a very special place. As you may know, the, the Pantheon goes back to uh, Imperial Rome. It was built under Emperor Hadrian and it was supposed to be there for all the gods. Uh, we may have lost the building as we lost many of the ancient Roman buildings. Uh, luckily, it was converted into a church. And that's how the building is still standing to this day. Because as you know, it's never good to leave buildings unused. For as long as somebody is in it, even if the maintenance is, um, uh, you know, rather parsimonious, the building has much better chances to, to survive. And that's why we still have uh, the Pantheon. So um, this is also where the kings of Italy are buried, by the way. <laughs> yeah, so imagine the place where Raphael uh, found his resting place, and here on top you see the famous oculo, right? um, divine eye through which light comes into uh, the pantheon. And now you may wonder, I mean, um, you heard me say before that Raffaello died very young. He died at the age of 37. What happened to him? Well, I did also say that um, he had many affairs. He definitely loved many women, and the story goes that um, he had um, gone out in the in winter time, and it was very cold. And on the way back to his um, to his home, uh, he felt terribly sick, uh, was afflicted with a uh, high fever. Um, and um, the only thing that doctors knew at that time, frankly, when it came to almost any illness or any any um, disease, was to do bloodletting. And so that was not nothing unusual. So doctors thought that would help Raphael, but um, um, modern physicians who, you know, looked into this story said, well, that was really the wrong, the wrong way to try to treat Raphael. He probably had a pneumonia. And so uh, doing bloodletting, right, by placing leeches, most likely, uh, was really a way to weaken um, uh, Raphael's um, uh, ability to resist the, the pneumonia. And uh, sadly, indeed, um, Raphael died after only eight days, and he died on his, on his first day, age of 37. Um, some people like to compare this to the early death of Mozart, right? Uh, Mozart died at the age of 35. Um, I had once a question to a famous French mathematician. His name was Henri Veil. He was the brother of uh, Simone Veil, French um, existential mystical philosopher who died in her early 30s. I asked him, how do you explain the early death of your sister? He gave me a wonderful answer that I think applies also here for, to Raffaello and also to Mozart. He said, some people live faster. Yeah. And maybe that in a way is what happened to Raffaello. Yeah. So um, here is the resting place inside the Pantheone. Um, I don't know whether he would have liked that or not, but he was, his, uh, his tomb was placed near um, Maria Bibiana's tomb, his fiance. She died before him. So at least in death, the two were reunited. Yeah? And um, usually there is a red rose at um, uh, Raphael's uh, resting place. 
And maybe next time you go to Rome, you'll have a red rose with you or even a lace. Thank you.